all of you here in your church welcome please sign the, re the attendance register the green vinyl folder in the pews uh, if you are not receiving a newsletter please include your address then the office will get one to you deacon rack night is Tuesday, is thursday excuse me june 7th we will meet here at the church at 6 p.m. and head out to participate in random acts of Christian kindness. All are welcome to join the deacons. The summer food program at Grant Street Community Center begins June 13th. If you can help, please see Sandy Earl or sign up today in Galbraith Hall. All singers, ringers, and other musicians are invited to Choir Appreciation Night on Thursday, June 14th at 6.30. We will have an ice cream buffet. Please RSVP to Lisa Rogers or call the church office if you can attend. There are a number of dates when help is needed at Glory Grill. If you can help, or if an organization you know can help, please see Les Shannon. Fourth Sunday Fellowship on June, June 24th will be lunch meat sliders and strawberries and angel food cake. We have to wait till June 24th? I'm ready. A free will offering will be accepted. The Walk on Water Challenge continues for one more week to help finance, finance a pool in Bolivia. All donations up to $200 will be met. Or 2,000, I'm sorry, it says 200. My apologies. A fundraiser 5K run walk to benefit Jonathan Weary is being held at the Y Zone on Saturday, June 23rd. Jonathan grew up in our church. She sustained a spinal cord injury back in November in a car accident and is now in a wheelchair. If you would like to walk with friends from FBC, pick up a form today in Galbraith Hall. Registration is $20 and the deadline is June 15th. Dates for children to attend Vacation Bible School are in today's bulletin. Please register by calling the church office uh, and signing up if you wish to attend. Chad Ubery now has a moment for PNC. Just wanted to uh, bring everyone uh, up, up to date on where we're at with the pastor uh, nominating committee. I know that, that folks are probably interested in, in, in hearing uh, what's, what's the status. Um, we have looked at probably uh, th this year we, we took the the Holy Cow survey last year and and uh, it went and then our um, church form went out live shortly after the new year so we're about six months into the into the process here and uh, we've probably looked at I would guess maybe 50 70 resumes over that that six month period and uh, we've kind of narrowed it down I and mean, we're not ready to make a decision yet, but, but we've interviewed probably, uh, I'd say, f seven or eight people. And as a matter of fact, tomorrow night we have another interview uh, scheduled here at the church. We'll be meeting with, with a candidate tomorrow evening to interview. Uh, so we're going through. We're meeting people. We're talking to people, um, uh, seeing sermons. Uh, we're going to be going actually to a couple of churches later this month and, and in early July to hear some, some candidates preach. Uh, so, you know, things are moving along. Again, we're not serious with anybody yet, but we are interviewing people. The process is moving. Um, and, and I know that, you know, Northminster got theirs and Clenmore's got theirs and folks are probably like, okay, you know, where, where are we at? Um, we just haven't found the right person yet, but we're diligently looking, um, always looking at, at, at different resumes, different sources um, to, to see who's out there. We're not leaving any, any stone unturned. So things are moving along. Uh, we just ask for your, your patience, but just know that we're not sitting, sitting idly. We are interviewing people, reviewing resumes, and um, 
we'll just keep you updated as the process is, is going. Certainly any questions at any time, you, you can see me, I'm, I'm chairing the committee, and our, our team has been listed in the bulletin uh, weekly, so any of us can answer any questions, so if you have anything, uh, please come and see me. Thank you. Today is a Sunday where you usually recognize graduates on every, every annual time in June, and today is a, the same day that we recognize graduates, and we're recognizing Connor Lee today. If you look in your bulletin, you, have a, you should have a little blurb there on Connor, and Connor is the, uh, the son of Lisa and Troy Lee and the grandson of Kathy Biddle, and if his, some of his family members are present, would they please come forward? We have something to give to Connor by way of you folks. Uh, Connor is a hard-working guy. In fact, he's working right now at McDonald's, this, as he does every Sunday. Uh, so his mom, Lisa, and maybe Kathy representing him are coming forward to let you know that Connor is graduating from Union Area High School. He plans to major in forestry at Penn State this fall. He is a church member and was involved in the youth group. In school, he was in the Scotty Marching Band. He was the co-creator of the Hiking Squad at Union. Some of those facts are there on the little insert that you have with his picture. He also worked in the stage crew for the plays. He was involved in Boy Scouts. He was a, he was a good fella and a hardworking, and we wish him well. So the Christian Education Committee, on behalf of the session and this congregation, would like to congratulate him on his graduation from high school. And there are some token uh, mem memories for him to make his transition into the real world of college, which is in here. And I'll give these to Lisa and Kathy. And um, we hope that uh, please convey our best to Connor. And we, we're proud of him, as you are proud of him, and we thank you for all of his participation in the life of this church. So let us pray. Dear Lord, bless Connor and his family as he starts another part of his life. Bless his family as they loosen their reins on him and help them all to trust in you to be with Connor and help him in all the circumstances and the, the adventures yet to come. We thank you for his life, and we thank you for this family, and we thank you for the Church of Jesus Christ that has helped him in so many ways. We pray all of this in Christ's most holy name, and all the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Let us listen to the prelude as we begin our worship.
please stand as you're able and join me in the call to worship as printed in the bulletin and projected on the wall. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Ever-present God, everything is still in your hands. Out of eternity, you have called each one of us into your church. See, awakened our souls to expectancy by choices we don't understand. Need us to help redeem the world by our faith in you. Help us to continue your incarnation, Heavenly Father. For we come to worship you, O God, and as Christians we come singing your praises. Amen. What we have, we bring. Our good intentions, our mixed motives, our uncertainties about life, our grasp of truth, our partial commitments, our small gifts. None of it is good enough. But it is what we offer and what we dare to affirm that is received. 
So in humility and faith, let us confess our sins before God and one another with the unison prayer of confession. Let us pray. O Lord of life, give to us the grace and the power to live risen lives. We pray that we may walk the way of our Savior Jesus the Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve. Fill our hearts with assurance of eternal life. Forgive our sins, though they be many. Make us confident that whether we live or die, we are yours, O Lord. We humbly come seeking forgiveness, silently lifting up all our personal sins in the name of Jesus Christ. Hear the good news. In the midst of our estrangement, we are received. We can receive our past, celebrate the present, and plan for the future. All because in the name of Jesus the Christ, our sins are forgiven. And all the people of God said, Amen. And as God has poured out forgiveness and peace through Christ, let us also share that grace with others by offering the sign of Christ's peace. Christ. How many know, what's this thing? What is it? Yeah, this is a life jacket. Why do you need a life jacket? What do you use a life jacket for? Yeah, if you fall, if you fall in the water out of a boat and you have a life jacket on, you won't sink. You'll float, right? That's what life jackets are for. They're to, to save us from sinking. Well, sometimes, even with a life jacket, if you fall off a boat, and you just bob around the water, and nobody comes to get you, you're just going to bob around the water forever. So, besides wearing a life jacket, you need to know how to swim. How many of you can swim? Can you all swim? Oh, good. Because you really need to swim. It's one of the most important things to learn when you're growing up is how to swim. It really is important. Because even if you don't have a life jacket and you fall in the water, you're really in trouble. If you don't know how to swim, if you know how to swim, at least you can try to swim around and, and wait for something. But a life jacket helps you. But even if you're in the water with a life jacket, you still need to swim to shore with your life jacket. Just life jacket makes it easier. You don't have to struggle to keep up. Well, the Bible, our Bible is a lot like a life jacket. It keeps us from sinking. If we know everything in the Bible, we learn what we need to know in the Bible, we won't sink into oblivion. We'll live forever. 
And we won't just bob along. The more we learn from the Bible, the more we know how to swim in our lives. And we know how to do all the things we need to do. So this is very important. It's just as important as a life jacket because this can save our lives forever. Life jacket, eh, for the time you're in the water. This life jacket, forever and ever and ever. So remember, make sure you hold on to your life jacket the rest of your life. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the Bible and for the life jackets you keep sending us through the Word. Help us to know all the things we need to know so we can keep swimming towards you. And we pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen. See you next time. Please pray with me. Ever-present God, you flow through the ages from the pages of Scripture, transforming our hearts with your challenge, moving those who hear to new acts of faith, courage, and mission. Bless our hearts and minds in the reading of your word so that we might know your presence and power more fully. We pray in the name of the living word, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Psalm 1 is an appropriate preface to the Psalter because it presents two major groups of people mentioned in many of the Psalms, the righteous and the wicked. Let's listen for the Word of God and read responsively Psalm 1, which is found on page 568 of your pew Bible and, of course, projected on the, on the wall. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Ah, the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous but the way of the wicked will perish. This is the word of the Lord. God. Yep. Thanks, Jeff. Mm -hmm. We now turn our attention to the New Testament, to Acts. Chapter 5, verses 27 through 48. Very intriguing passage. On their second appearance before the Sanhedrin, the apostles found an unexpected helper. Gamaliel was a Pharisee and was more than respected. He was loved. He was a kindly man with a far wider tolerance than many of his cohorts. So the Sanhedrin listened to Gamaliel 
And once again, after threatening the apostles, they let them go. Fascinating story. Let's listen for the Word of God. Acts 5, starting with the verse number 27. And when they brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And then he said to them, Men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Thutius rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found in opposing God. So they took his advice, and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. O oh God, may you bless not only the readings of your word and the singing of your word and the playing of your word, but now the interpretation of your word that it all might become your word to us on this Sunday in June. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. A common slang expression usually offering up some, some kind of accolade about something is, is to say, oh, that's cool. I think my generation probably started it first before anybody else did, and then it's continued in each generation in various forms, and hey, that's cool. But I believe a Christian goes beyond cool to icy hot. Because when something's red hot, it's alive. And it has power. It has vitality. And I'd rather be a red-hot Christian than a cool Christian. In fact, I read that there is sufficient evidence to claim that the nuclear capacity in a single human being can turn the city of Los Angeles into a rubble of dust. Yeah. Think about that. There's enough power in you, in your body, as you sit in your pew, to turn a city of 8 million people into nothing but ashes. That's how much power you have in you. But if that's true, <laughs> then why is it that so many people's lives resemble 25-watt bulbs? Look at the record of the New Testament. It's joy and power 
fulfilled. Jesus, on the evening of his last supper, said to his disciples, I've said all these things to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Stephen, the very first martyr, at the very moment when the stones of his enemies were crushing the life out of him, lifts up his eyes to heaven, praises the risen Christ, and dies joyfully forgiving his enemies. Paul and Silas were thrown into prison in the dark midnight hours. What did they do? They started singing hymns of joy and power and praise. And then there's John, a man with such an incendiary faith. They had tried to place him on a, a little tiny island separating him from everybody else with an ocean, a little tiny island called Patmos. And what did he do? He started to sing songs of praise to God and writes about Jesus as King of kings and Lord of lords. And look at our scripture today. As the apostles left the council, they were happy. They were joyful because God had considered them worthy to suffer disgrace for the sake of Jesus. And every day in the temple, and in people's hands, homes, they continued to preach and preach the good news about Jesus. The disciples announced the good news of Jesus by shouting it from the housetops after they were arrested, after they were tried, after they were convicted, after they were beaten, after they were released. And that's not 25-watt bulb living. That's power-filled living. I was waiting a, to catch a plane one day in an airport a while back, moseying around, looking at magazines. I happened to pick up a copy of Surfing Magazine. I never read that magazine. I didn't even know there was it. But this is a surfing magazine, so I picked it up, and I started reading it. And, and it was fascinating. John Rothrock one of the world's champion surfboard riders and longtime surf coach at Edison High in Huntington Beach, California, up until his death in January of 1995, wrote about surfing in this magazine. And this is what he said. He said, there's a need in all of us for controlled danger. There's a need for an activity that puts us on the edge of life. There are uncounted millions of people going through life without any real vibrant kick, he said. He said, there's a need to ride the white water. And I believe that's true, that we Christians are to know what it is to live on the edge of life and to ride the white water. I was intrigued as I read Rothrock's article. And as I read, I discovered that the basic principles of, of surfing can apply to the Christian life. And if we follow them, we'll know the joy and the enthusiasm that those first century Christians knew. For example, the most elemental principle of surfing is this. If you're going to have a good ride, you have to go out to where the big waves are. To ride the white water, you need to get out in the deep water. You can't expect to have a good ride if all, you spend all your time paddling around in the shallow surf on the beach. And look at the scene before us today. The disciples had been out boldly and fearlessly preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. They were doing just what the angel told them to do, and then they were arrested. They'd been out in the white water, where you find the big waves of witnessing. They were putting their lives on the line for the sake of the gospel. And then they were dragged out of the white water before the Sanhedrin, the supreme court of the Jews. Now, we might liken the Sanhedrin to a kind of beachcomber brigade. 
Yeah, they were, they were a group of people who never got out into the water. The two kinds of men made up the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Sadducees were political types. They were like bits of seaweed on the shore, and every time a little ripple from Rome would come in, they'd, they'd move in accordance with the current and how it would direct them. And then there were the Sadducees, the Pharisees, excuse me. Now the Pharisees stood around and made sure that nothing dirty ever got onto the beach. They chased everything away. Birds, footprints, stray shells. Yeah. <laughs> Reminds me of, of a, sto a story of a father with his little four-year-old son at the beach. And his little four-year-old ran up to him and grabbed his hand and said, Daddy, Daddy, come, come quick. And he, he dragged his daddy over to where a, a seagull lay dead in the sand. He said, Daddy, Daddy, what, what happened to him? The father looked at his son. Well, son, um, he died and, and went to heaven. And the little boy looked at the seagull and pondered this and, and said, Well, did God throw him back? The beach brigade wouldn't even allow God to mess up the beach. So the whitewater people, who have been out in the risk of real adventuring, are brought face to face with the beachcomber brigade. Now the beachcombers are kind of at a loss of exactly what to do. This is the second time they had to bring these guys in. So they go to the most honored of their number, a man named Gamaliel. And it could be said of Gamaliel that he built the most splendid castles out of sand. The leader of the Beachcomber Brigade gave them Beachcomber counsel. He said, fellas, I tell you, don't take any action against these men. Leave them alone. If what they've planned and done is of human origin, It'll be disappear. But if it's from God, you cannot possibly defeat them, and you could find yourselves fighting against God. So the Beachcomber Brigade took the counsel of Gamaliel, only as far as not publicly denouncing them. They just took him out behind the barn and beat him up, and then let him go. So the lesson. When you get out into the waves of white water, you're going to get knocked about. When one of those swells of life picks you up, it also has the ability to put you down. And you can get churned up in the surf as part of the risk of dealing with white water. Wrestling with the big wave issues of the day is part of the adventure of really living. There was a man who came to me one day when I was serving a church in Minnesota. And he said to me quite literally, <laughs> he said, Pastor, I'll give you $1,000 right now if you'll help me get rid of all my problems. thousand bucks right now. I said, Really? Okay, uh, let me understand stand you. Now, you want to be with a group of people who have no problems and no difficulties, and you want to be one with them. Is that right? That's what I'm looking for. That's what I want. I said, okay, I'll tell you what to do. All you have to do is get in your car, go down to the Mississippi River Bridge, take the first exit, and you'll see a very big high wrought iron fence. Go through that gate. You are now in the Minneapolis Memorial National Cemetery and there are about 10,000 people there and none of them have any problems. To be alive is to have problems. To be dealing with the issues of life. The question then becomes, are we going to be spending all of our time dealing with the minor issues in the puddles and the pools along the shore, or are we going to go out and wrestle with the whitewater issues of the day? The early Christians had the answer. 
as soon as they were beaten up by the Sanhedrin, they went out rejoicing and took up their ministry again. Whitewater people. And I think we need to take our cue from those first century Christians to be alive in a world such as this today with all kinds of magnificent causes crying out to us. Sometimes we, we, we don't realize that, that, that they're causes. Young people to be brought to the faith. Older people to be brought into new ministries. Inner cities to be reclaimed. High school shooting tragedies needing to be addressed. Churches needing to be redeveloped. World mission fields opening for the gospel in a way they've never been opened before. Inner space, the understanding of humankind. Outer space, new galaxies opening up before our very eyes. There's never been a time so filled with causes to which one can give oneself in the name of Jesus Christ. Life can be thrilling out there in the white water. And we disciples of Jesus Christ need to go out to that white water. That's where the surfboard of faith begins. The second basic principle of surfing is this. When you get out there, you have to lean into the wave. You have to lean into it. You can't just sit there and watch all the waves go by. You have to catch them and stand up by leaning into the wave. Notice that these disciples, when they were warned and beaten, they did not cease from their ministry. They immediately returned rejoicing. You see, these people built their life around the cross. And the currents that move at the foot of the cross are fast-moving currents. You don't need chlorine to purify water at the base of the cross. That water is always rushing and moving and cra carrying the great issues of the day. And they went out and they leaned into that water. And as you lean into the curl of the wave, it's a magnificent moment, says Rothrock. He says to be picked up by that water and, and you're riding the very top of the wave and then you're under the curl and you can hear, he said, the whole ocean roaring behind you and around you as if it's angry in a race with you and you're beating it. And as your surfboard quivers and hisses at your feet, he says it sounds like 10,000 yards of tearing silk. And there's a splendid glory in that. Whitewater Christians get to hear that. But of course, a lot of people think, oh yeah, right, Rick, that's too impulsive, that's too dangerous. Come on. But I say, when applied to the things of the faith, it's not that impulsive. If that kind of leaning into the wave is too impulsive, well, then Mary was too impulsive when she broke that alabaster jar and anointed her Savior's feet. Then those men were too impulsive when they tore a hole in the roof in order to get their friend down to Jesus. Matthew was too impulsive when he left, got up from his tax table and followed Jesus. Martin Luther was too impulsive when he stood up against the Holy Roman Empire and said, here I stand, I cannot do otherwise, God help me, amen. Livingston was too impulsive when he went out searching not only for the headwaters of the Nile, but to bring a whole continent to Jesus Christ. Niemöller and Bonhoeffer were too impulsive when they stood against Hitler's Germany and held high the cross of Christ. The Christian faith is to be a mixture of burning enthusiasm and random extravagance. Tennyson said it a long time ago, and the line has been repeated so often that we've kind of lost the sense of it, but it's still true. He said it's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved and at all. Use the opportunities that God brings you or you'll lose them. 
Now, leaning into the wave, riding the curl, that calls for commitment and loyalty. And if the early disciples didn't have this kind of loyalty, then Christianity would never have gotten out of Galilee. It takes discipline. But when you know, when you know and you believe that for me to live is Christ and you seek first the kingdom of God, then you can hear 10,000 yards of tearing silk. Not safety first, but the Savior first. Not business first, but blessings first. Not family first, but faith first. Not thrift first, but tithe first. Jesus is calling for faith that deals with the big issues of life. For we have a big, rough God who puts his hands down into the center of our lives to move us into the pressing issues of the day that we might have the thrill and the joy of being part of the dynamic Christian experience which he wills for us to be white water Christians. The question simply is this. Do we pamper ourselves into mediocrity or do we forget ourselves into immortality? At the end of the day, the surfer stumbles up on the beach, thoroughly tested, but there's a feeling of being one with life. You're tired, but not tired in what you're doing. You're just tired in it. Never tired of the things of Christ, but sometimes seriously exhausted in the pursuit of them. And as the apostles left the council, they were happy because God had considered them worthy to suffer disgrace for the sake of Jesus. And every day in the temple and in people's homes, they continued to teach and preach the good news about Jesus, the Messiah. So, here's the message. Listen, did you hear it? Did you hear it? Surf's up. Get your boards and get out there. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts have been acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let us stand to sing.
Let us remain standing as we dedicate our lives to God by reaffirming our faith using the Apostles' Creed. Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Before our offering time, let us pray. Father God, accept these our offerings, not ours but yours this money, earned by the skill of hand and brain, lest we forget that we are not our own but yours. Use this money to buy the imperishable goods of life and mercy and peace as we pledge to you our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. As we come to our prayer time together, please note all those in the back of the bulletin. On the prayer chain, we need to keep those folks in our prayers and so many more. Pray with me. Oh God, we thank you for creating such fascinating places, like the shorelines of our great lakes and oceans with their myriad of water creatures, their plethora of shells and plants, their rhythmic tides and shifting breezes. We thank you for occasions to enjoy such glories of your creation. So let the lakes and the oceans speak to us of the vastness and power of your grace. Let the abundance of sand 
Remind us of all the persons you love. Let the lifeguards remind us of your everlasting concern for our salvation. Lord, our needs are as many as we are. Some of us have been unloving, some of us untrue to one another. Some have neglected caring for another. Grant us assurance of forgiveness and new beginnings. We need your guidance. Some of us are struggling with a decision. Some of us are wrestling with a problem. Some of us are wading through troubled waters. Grant us illumination. Grant us direction. Grant us resolution. As we try to perceive your surrounding strength, Some of us are suffering in body. Some of us are lonely. Some of us are afraid. Grant us awareness of your presence, awareness of your power, awareness of your peace. We need your love, not only for us, but for the world. Some of us are parochial in our perspective. Some of us are self-centered in our concerns. Some of us are self-serving in all our actions. Grant us a higher sensitivity, a deeper compassion, a broader concern. We have innumerable other needs, Lord. Some of them are too personal to name. Some are too complicated to label. Some are too threatening to admit but you know them as you know us and you are with us. So we lift up to you these prayers now in the silence of our souls as we listen for your answers. Now in the spirit of Jesus of Nazareth, always your word to us as the Christ. Hear us as we join all the world today in praying the prayer that your son taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us stand to sing.
want to thank Patty for filling in for Don today. And I'm going to leave you with a different benediction because of the sermon. So let us receive this benediction. May God sit beside you on the sandy seashore of all your yesterdays as the sun sets upon the labors of your hands. May God stroll with you in the morning as the sun rises on all your hopes and dreams. May God walk with you at the edge of the breaking waves where the sandpipers and the seagulls run and fly in freedom and search. And as you kick your toes in the sand, may some prize of driftwood or sea life be there to glorify God and to remind you and all of us in this world as beachcombers were captured by such reminders of faraway places where human and divine are constant in the one who came to these shores and revealed the true life of the beachcomber, Jesus Christ, in whose name we go, in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.